This is the machine I've built so far in this series, and I call it pure Turing. This is a little bit of a contradiction because the machine Turing defined has infinite memory, so there are no true pure Turing machines. An alternate definition has come about though, which is a Turing machine which has enough memory to do the task you're interested in. This machine closely follows Turing's definition and has enough memory to emulate a 6502. The reason I've called it pure Turing is that for the purposes of this channel, this is as close to a Turing machine as we're going to get, and I want to be able to contrast it to modifications that we're going to make. Two of the great pioneers in the field of computing are Alan Turing with his Turing machine and John von Neumann with his von Neumann architecture. If you can imagine there being a continuum between these two ideas, then I'd place pure Turing right about here. Not quite all the way over to the left, mainly because of the infinite memory issue. But we've seen that the machine we've built is very slow, and this is because of the sequential access to memory. In this video, we're going to slide to the right towards the von Neumann architecture by adding a memory address register and a memory data register. This doesn't get us all the way to a von Neumann architecture, but it does move us away from the machine that Alan Turing defined in his 1936 paper. We want our computing engine to be able to read and write from random access memory. It needs to have control of the memory address register. This is just a bunch of D-type flip-flops that drives the address lines going into the random access memory. We also have a memory data register, which interfaces with the data lines. Now these lines are bidirectional, which means we can read from the memory or we can write to the memory. Let's go back to our pure Turing implementation from the previous video. This is how I've laid down the 6502 registers and the main memory on the Turing tape, which I also call the notepad. And we found that the machine is really slow, because when we want to access some memory, we first have to go out and mark the page number, then come back, go out and mark the byte within the page, then come back, then go out to the position we've marked and either read data or write data. Next, we make the final return trip. Typically, these three round trips will take 1.5 million clocks, but it could actually take up to 3 million clocks. What we're going to do to address this is divide our notepad in two. We'll have one memory system for the internal 6502 state and another memory for the Apple II main memory. If we concentrate on memory system A, we can see that we only need 141 notepad locations. This means we can cut our notepad address from 20 bits down to 8. We can think of this part of the circuit as being memory system A. I'm going to transfer from breadboard to printed circuit board for this part of the build. Here we can see the three EEPROMs that we've used previously. And each EEPROM has an octal D-type flip-flop to capture the output. 14 bits from the output are used to feed back into the address lines. This forms our rulebook, which is also a finite state machine. In this part of the design, we also have the 74HC244 octal buffer, and we use this to connect the rulebook to the notepad. I start with my blank printed circuit board, and I solder in place the sockets for the EEPROMs. I suggest you only try this technique if you've had a lot of experience soldering. You use the solder mask to form a bead of solder, and you run that down the length of the chip. Now the sockets for the three octal D-type flip-flops, and the 74HC244. This technique's fast, but you've got to expect solder bridges like this one that I've just found. I can tell you this is a lot faster than the breadboard build. Next, we need to build memory system A, which stores all the state that's normally contained within the 6502. We have two 4-bit adders that are wired together to form an 8-bit adder. We have an octal D-type flip-flop to store the current notepad location. We're using this large static RAM for the notepad, and although it has a capacity of 128 kilobytes, we're really only using 512 bits. I'm going to use the same construction technique to solder one or two pins of each socket first, then I run a bead of solder down the side of each chip. This is running at about 20 times real time, but to get this far into the build I only took about 20 minutes all up, compared to hours for the equivalent breadboard build. 
So far, the design's pretty much the same as our breadboard design, except we have an 8-bit notepad pointer rather than the 20-bit notepad pointer. But things start to change here substantially when we look at memory system B. This is essentially the Apple II main memory. Before I do that, though, I need to go over a very common component in digital logic, the shift register. The main feature of the shift register is that the output of one D flip-flop is connected to the input of the next. We can make a shift register from an octal D-type flip-flop by wiring it up like this. We leave one input for serial data, then every time on the positive edge of clock, the contents moves up and the new data is loaded into the bottom bit. Then eventually, after eight clock signals, our bit sequential serial input is converted into a parallel output stream. Our behavior coming out of the rule book is 24 bits wide, and I've recently showed you some new outputs, mRead and mWrite. Now I'm going to define three more outputs, data clock, serial data, and address clock. Now here's the tricky bit. I'm going to hook up some of these new outputs to a shift register. In this case, I'm using serial data and data clock. I need a way to control these outputs. We previously had a diagrammatic representation of each rule. Well, what I'm going to do is allow each arc to specify these outputs. If they're not mentioned, they're presumed to be zero. But here we see the top arc setting mread to be one. Another arc sets address clock to be one. If we want, we can set multiple signals to be high. But you may be wondering why I'm going to the effort of doing this. In a previous video, I showed that at the start of the notepad, we have two dollar symbols, the status register, another dollar symbol, then the A and B register interleave with each other. Let me show you how we might use these output signals. This is quite a busy slide, but at the top we have the notepad. The A register contains the value 5A in hexadecimal. We have this state machine with five rules of five states. And some of these states set the serial data or the data clock to be one. Then on the right, we have an external shift register, which generates a parallel output. We start off in rule 250 and with the notepad pointer above B0. We read, then write back whatever we just read and move to the left. In rule 251, we read the zero off the notepad, write a zero back over the top of it, move left, and go to rule 252. Now here's the important bit. In rule 252, we raise data clock. This causes a zero to be shifted into our most significant bit in our external shift register. Remember that most shift registers actually shift on the rising edge of clock. In rule 251, we see the one in the A1 location on the notepad. We write back one, move left, and most importantly, we make the serial data output one. Then in rule 253, we keep serial data one, but we raise the data clock. This has the effect of shifting a one into the most significant bit in the external shift register. We keep doing this as we scan from right to left over the notepad. As we get further into the process, you'll see that the bit pattern in A in the upper left is slowly being transferred into the shift register. We can also do this for other registers, such as the program counter and the effective address register. Now I'm going to go into a bit more detail about how I set up access to the random access memory. I start with 512k of static RAM, and this static RAM has a 512k shadow EEPROM. This EEPROM is uploaded on reset, but it's not really used after that at all. I only actually need 64 kilobytes, so I can change this to 128k parts if I want. For my memory address register, I'm going to use two octal D-type flip-flops, and these have been wired up as a 16-bit shift register. The clock and data signal driving this shift register come directly from the rulebook. This means the rulebook can generate a 16-bit address, one bit at a time. I'm going to use two chips for the memory data register one for the write path and one for the read path. For the write path, I'm just going to use an octal D-type flip-flop, which is set up as an 8-bit shift register. This is very similar to the memory address register, except it's 8-bit rather than 16. It uses the same data signal from the rule book, but it has its own clock. 
For the read memory address register, I'm going to use the 74HC165. This is a parallel in, but serial out shift register. This allows me to read 8 bits from the main memory at a time, and convert it into a serial bit stream. This serial data signal goes back to one of the address lines on the rulebook. This does double the size of the rulebook, and it means my graphical representation has to take into account the data in signal. It might seem kind of crazy, but I hand drew many of the state machines for pure Turing. This moves the memory data register into X. Most of the states ignore data in, but here we can see that it follows the top arc if data in is low, and the bottom arc if data in is high. For any given bit position within X, if data in is low, then we write 0 into that bit position, but if data in is high, then we write 1 into that bit position. We keep looping around, raising clock while we are over the U bit, and we keep doing this until we hit a dollar symbol. I'm going to start by adding in the static RAM and the EEPROM, which form memory system B, and the octal D type flip flops, which I wire up as a shift register for the memory address register. Now, this is a mistake. I've labeled the address lines going into the memory A0 through A15, and this should really be G0 through G15. I'll fix that up later. This is where I generate the 16 bit shift register out of the octal D type flip flops. The output on the chip on the left are labelled G0 through G7, but the inputs are G1 through G8. This means on each clock cycle, the output of G0 takes on the previous value of G1, and so forth. Now I'm going to put in the octal D type flip flop for the right pathway of the memory data register, and I'm going to label this F0 through F7. I'll put a placeholder in for the read pathway. But here I want to use the 74HC165, which is the parallel in serial out shift register. In my system, I want to receive the least significant bit first, and I know that D7 is output first, so I need to change the ordering so that F0 is down the bottom and F7 is up the top. I just need to use a bit of KiCad trickiness to do this. I just need a few more control signals. You'll notice that I've used mread bar and mwrite bar, but the rulebook only generates mread and mwrite. I also want to read from the EEPROM when mread and mwrite are both high. I can achieve all of this with NAND gates, so I'm just going to use a single 74HC00. Two to invert mread and mwrite, and one to generate the ROM output enable signal. Finally, I need to add the Arduino to the circuit. I'm going to snoop on all these behavioural outputs from the rulebook. Also, I need to generate the clock, clock bar, and reset bar signal. I'm going to use exclusive OR gates for this, so that clock and clock bar are closely in phase. One set up as an inverter, and one set up as a buffer. Alright, I think we're ready to start the build. I need to solder in the sockets for the memory address registers, the memory data registers, the static RAM, and the EEPROM. I fix up any bridges that might form as I go along. If you can master this technique, it is actually pretty cool to see something built so quickly. Don't forget, solder masks were invented for wave soldering. That's the chips all done. Now I need to solder in this resistor network then all the regular resistors, and the decoupling capacitors. I'll show you the first couple, but I think I'll skip over the rest. I just need to put the Arduino Nano into place, and we should be done. It's a bit hard to tell from this footage, but I've actually socketed the Arduino as well. This is what the board looks like before inserting all the chips. Here I have the board fully populated. But instead of being connected to a Nano, it's connected up to an Arduino GUI. This in turn directly drives this 10 inch TFT display. OK, let's power it up and reset the GUI. Now, the GUI writes this initial maze pattern, but from here on in, all the information for the pixel updates is coming from the board. The scores have been updated, and now for the ghosts. This is being displayed in real time, there's no speed up. 
and it took our original pure Turing several days to get to this point. But, obviously, it's still quite a bit slower than real time. This has been sped up by a factor of 100, and it's still quite a bit slower than real time. That is, real time on the Apple II. This entire clip that you're looking at took about 20 minutes to generate, but it would have taken weeks or months to generate on the machine that had sequential access. You might be wondering what our performance gain is having added in the random access memory. I ran the emulator for 20,000 instructions, and each instruction is equivalent to one 6502 instruction. On the pure Turing machine, this took 65 billion clocks, which turned out to be 3.2 million per instruction. Now this might be a little higher than you're expecting, it was actually higher than I was expecting, but when you think about it, some instructions like JSR and incremented an absolute address actually require five memory accesses for the entire instruction. For example, increment absolute address has the instruction, it has two bytes for the address, it then has to go and read from this address, and then write back to this address. Executing this instruction is likely to take about 7.5 million clocks, so I guess it's not so surprising that the average is about 3 million. I ran exactly the same code for 20,000 instructions on this modified machine with random access, and executing the 20,000 instructions took 50 million clock cycles. So that's about 2,500 clock cycles per instruction. Just let that sink in for a moment. Adding random access increased performance by three orders of magnitude. What's more, I haven't even added random access to memory system A. You'll have to wait for next video for that though. For now, like, share, and subscribe.